cancer is the abnormal growth of cells in your body basically cells that should stay quiet grow and divide and spread through your body and cause problems in ancient Greece 2000 years ago Hippocrates was the father of modern medicine and he observed all sorts of illnesses one of the illnesses he observed was cancer skin cancer to him skin cancer looked like a crab on the skin so he gave it the name cancero which is crab in Greek and uh, that name has stuck ever since. Their major pre predators are octopi, octopuses, if you like. And that's probably a good idea from the octopus's point of view. If you've got eight legs, you've got a much better chance of getting control of a crab than if you just have two arms. Yeah, we really need all the tentacles we can get, if you like, to get cervical cancer under control. We want to prevent the infection that causes cervical cancer. We want to treat the disease before it becomes cancer once the infection is there. And we want to have ways of treating cancer better and finding it in the community so we can eradicate cervical cancer. And the WHO's um, recommended three specific approaches. Can you walk me through those? Well, one is vaccination, obviously, because now we have a vaccine that can prevent the infection that triggers cervical cancer. A second one is a screening for cervical pre-cancer, so we can catch the cancer before it's there. We know that the virus that causes cancer makes abnormal cells in the cervix many years before those abnormal cells turn into cancer. So screening is a very effective means of preventing cervical cancer. And indeed in Australia, until the vaccine became available, we were doing a really good job in controlling cervical cancer amongst women who took part in the screening programs. But it's harder to get women to take part in screening than it is to give a vaccine. And then the third arm of cervical cancer control is good treatment, which means that you have to go out there and develop ways of treating cervical cancer in parts of the world where, to be blunt, they're not able to do that at the moment. And we need to know more about the disease. I mean, globally, cervical cancer is a very common cancer, commonest cancer amongst women. And we need to understand why that is and what we can do to stop it. It's a growth of the cells in the neck of the womb. That's the cervix. And uh, it's triggered off by a virus infection. It's unique amongst cancers in that it's 100% triggered off by a virus infection. If you don't have the virus, you can't get the cancer. But basically then these cells grow in the neck of the womb and then spread through the rest of the body. And that's when cervical cancer becomes a big problem. It was a, it's a very unpleasant way to die. And it's so frustrating seeing patients that you would like to treat and you simply haven't got anything to offer them. It can be treated, but it is much easier treated if we get it early. The vaccine is designed to stop people catching the infection that triggers off cervical cancer. It's triggered off by infection with human papillomavirus and they come in many different flavours if you like, but there are about nine of the over 200 papillomaviruses that we know about that can trigger off a cervical cancer and therefore vaccination with a vaccine to prevent those nine getting into the body seems to be an effective way of preventing cervical cancer now and in the future. The critical thing is to get the vaccine before you get the infection because this vaccine can't cure you of these viruses if you've already got them. So we recommend that the vaccine should be given about the age of 10 to 12 before people become sexually active because the virus is mostly spread through sexual activity. Australia has been leading the charge right since we got the vaccine license for use back in 2007. We've basically managed to immunise the majority of young women and also now young men to prevent the spread of the virus infection that causes cervical cancer. Of course, we were also leading the charge in screening before the vaccine came along. And indeed, we've set the benchmark, if you like, on a global basis for effective screening to prevent cervical cancer. The studies done in the middle of the 2000s showed very clearly that the only cervical cancers that were occurring in Australia were amongst people who had never been screened. So if they had been taking part in the screening program, they didn't get cervical cancer. Well, globally, cervical cancer kills over 300,000 women every year. So it's a very major cause of death. And it's an entirely avoidable disease if we could get the vaccines out into the world at large, if we could get screening programs out into the world at large for those people who've already got the infection, then we could seriously eradicate cervical cancer over the next few years. Well, the World Health Organization has set an objective of getting rid of cervical cancer this century. So by 2100, it should be possible in their mind. 
And if we can implement all of these programs, particularly vaccination, but also screening and treatment, then we should be able to eradicate cervical cancer in the next 70, 80 years. Vaccines are probably going to be the major part of it globally because screening is more difficult in the developing world. Unless you have a lot of resources, it's difficult to run a screening program. So vaccination will probably be the major part of getting rid of it. But those countries that can run screening programs, of course, are being encouraged to do that because there are a lot of women out there already infected with the virus who are going to go on and get cervical cancer unless we run screening programs. I always, as a doctor, wanted to be able to help people. and. Uh, learn very quickly that there are a lot of very good doctors out there but there are a lot of problems that need to be solved in order to make healthcare better. So I decided I would focus on medical research and I'm lucky enough to pick an area where something could be done. I mean I didn't set out in my research career to work on a vaccine to prevent cervical cancer but I was very much interested in vaccines and how vaccines worked and it just happened that I became interested in papillomavirus because of uh, observations that uh, other people had made and my natural inclination was to say, well, look, here's a virus which has just recently been shown to cause a cancer. Well, let's see if we can get a vaccine because vaccines have been the best thing we can do to prevent all sorts of infectious diseases. And this one was crying out for a vaccine. We now know that 20% of all cancers are caused by virus infections. Uh, we equally know that 80% of them are not caused by virus infections. What's happened is that people have done a global search, if you like, to see if viruses might be involved in triggering off cancer. That started a long time ago with a guy called Shope who showed that in, at least in animals, papillomavirus had, could cause cancer. And that was shown in the 1920s. There was a guy in New York, another Greek, Papa Nicolaou, who was interested in cervical uh, cancer because he knew the disease existed by that time and that he, we had a better understanding of what cancer was, that it was an abnormal growth of cells. So he developed a test to look for cervical cancer, which now gets called the pap smear after him. And uh, the, it basically looked for abnormal cells. But he didn't have any clues as to why the cells were abnormal. And that really didn't start happening until the mathematicians went back to looking at data much as Ragoni Stern had done in Italy in the 19th century and they started looking to see if there was any association of cervical cancer with infection. I mean they'd seen Ragoni Stern's paper and they were trying to work out if this might be a sexually transmitted disease if you like and they started by looking at herpes virus but that didn't map correctly and then Harold Zerhausen came in to the story because he as a researcher knew about the work that had been done previously with papillomaviruses and cancers in animals and he thought well if cervical cancer occurred in the same place as genital warts occurred when we knew genital warts were caused by papillomavirus maybe papillomavirus could cause cervical cancer as well and that was a hypothesis if you like an educated guess but what then happened was a whole group of people looked to see if you could make papillomavirus turn cells that were normal into cancer cells in the lab. And once about half a dozen groups had shown very clearly that some papillomavirus genes could turn normal cells into cancer cells, then it was recognized that it was very likely that the papillomavirus was causing the cancer and wasn't just there by chance. I met Harold Zurhausen in Germany in 1984 when the I was really working on liver disease and uh, there was somebody else in the institute in Germany that was working on liver disease. I went and visited him and he took me to meet Harold Zerhausen, who was the director of the institute in, Ger in Germany. And Harold asked me what I was doing, said I was working on liver disease and he said, look, you should go and work on papillomavirus and cervical cancer, it'll be much more interesting. Uh, and I was in the process of moving laboratories at that time. I thought, okay, I'll take that interest in papillomavirus with me. Mm -hmm. And that started me working on papillomavirus. And I picked up with my colleagues in Melbourne that there was another cancer that was caused by papillomavirus. There's anal cancer, cancer around the back passage. And it also mapped in the same way that it was a sexually transmitted infection, if you like. And uh, that this was a second cancer that papillomavirus causes. Yeah, now we recognize that there are several other cancers caused by papillomavirus, but it was this linkage to anal cancer that got me really interested. Said, right, okay, this is a, a clear virus target now that we should be trying to do something about. And so we originally, I worked with my colleague Jan Zhu to try and develop a way of treating papillomavirus infection because I thought that would be kind of useful. 
because we didn't know then whether papillomavirus was a very common infection or a very rare infection. And I thought, well, maybe it'll be a rare infection that commonly causes cancer, so we need to be able to treat the infection. Turns out, of course, that it's a common infection which rarely causes cancer, and that's when a vaccine is a much more appropriate way to go. And that's when Jan and I started work on a vaccine. Yeah, we had the opportunity to do that because there was a new technology came along at that time, which and unlike most things that are breakthroughs in science, they actually depend on breakthroughs in technology. And there the breakthrough in technology was that you could actually take a gene from the virus in this case and express it in a, a near human cell and the gene would behave and produce what it would have done if the infection had been there. And we were interested in making the shell of the virus and we needed this technology to enable us to make the proteins that became the shell of the virus. And the shell of the virus became the vaccine. It's a very safe vaccine. It's, it's like most vaccines that we use. There's nothing alive in there. It's just dead protein and the immune system sees it as if it were the live virus, but there's nothing live there. It's just we're tricking the immune system into making a response that protects against the infection. I'm very pleased for what science has delivered to the community. That's what we're here to do. And from a personal point of view, obviously, it's very satisfying to have been part of that story. But I would stress that all science is a team effort. I mean, if Harold Sirhausen hadn't done what he did, then we wouldn't have known about the virus. And if the people who showed that the virus could cause cancer in the lab hadn't done that, then there would have been no justification for a vaccine. And if the people that did the technology that we used to eventually express the proteins hadn't done that, we wouldn't have been able to make a vaccine. And then after we did make the vaccine, of course, it took a whole lot of people to turn our efforts on making a teaspoonful of vaccine into making a swimming pool full of it so we could go out there and immunize globally. Yes, look, uh, there's challenges getting any vaccine rolled out. People are suspicious about vaccines. Current suspicions about COVID vaccines probably reflect the fact that a certain percentage of the population are never sure about vaccines. And you're giving vaccines as a treatment to normal, healthy people. And therefore, people are a bit skeptical. But the big challenge Two big challenges, I guess. The first one was this was an expensive vaccine. When it first came out, the technology was new. 15 years of development time had to be paid for, and that was, of course, what the companies had done, and therefore they wanted to get their 15 years of development cost back. And secondly, it's a complex vaccine. It's nine different bits in it, and most vaccines just have one. And therefore, you're really buying nine vaccines when you're paying for it. So that, that made it an expensive vaccine and therefore hard to get out. The second thing is that there were no programs at that time aimed at adolescent health globally. You know, you, it's easy to give vaccines to two-year-olds because there's lots of health programs in every part of the world that are aimed at two-year-olds, to healthy babies, if you like. But when you come to start saying you want to approach 12-year-old girls, there's no mechanism for doing that. So you have to create one. And that is quite easy in a country like Australia, where we have good schools-based health programs. But if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, if you go to Vanuatu, where we did programs there, all the girls have left school by the time they're 10, or by the vast majority of them, and you have no contact with them. So we had to move the vaccine program in Vanuatu back to the last year of primary school, when most of the girls were still there. So it's that sort of practical issue. If you go to Bhutan, where we've also done programs, the schools are four or five hours walk from the nearest road. So somebody has to carry the vaccine in or the girls have to come to where the vaccine can be given. And they tried both approaches in Bhutan, but when they started asking the girls to come to where the vaccines could be given, then instead of getting 100% coverage, they fell to 50% coverage. And then when they went back to giving the vaccines in the schools, then it went back up to 100% again. So that it's how do you get the vaccine to the schools? Well, in Vanuatu, they're using drones to fly the vaccine from the, where the boat comes in on the shore to where the village is, because it's hard work carrying vaccines. They're heavy and you've got to keep them cold. So it's these sort of innovative solutions that enable vaccine programs to be delivered worldwide to overcome these challenges that were there when we started the programs. So in Australia, we vaccinate boys as well as girls, and there are good reasons for doing that. I mean, one is that boys get cancers caused by these viruses too. Anal cancer and oropharyngeal cancer, throat cancers are sometimes caused by papillomavirus. About 70% of the throat cancers are caused by papillomavirus now. The second reason for doing the boys is that if the girls haven't been immunized, you can protect the girls by immunizing the boys. So that, that means you get what's called herd immunity. 
And then the third reason is that there are always some suspicions arisen in people's minds if you start talking about immunising just one sex. They think maybe you're trying to sterilise the girls or something worse, you know, so that if you immunise boys and girls, and it's universal. Yeah, look, th this vaccine is proven safe. We've delivered 200 million doses of the vaccine worldwide already. Uh, we do not see any adverse events from the vaccine. It is a safe vaccine like the other vaccines that we use for routine childhood prevention of infections. We have a lot of experience now and we are very confident, not only because the vaccine is made to be safe and the way that it's made is such that there's nothing in there that can cause any problems, but also from experience now we can see that the vaccine is safe. Well, vaccines are the single most effective public health measure that we've had after clean water and good food. They have made a huge impact on disease. This vaccine rates with the poliovirus vaccine in terms of its ability to prevent disease. If we look back at the history of poliovirus, roughly the same number of people used to die of polio every year as currently are dying of cervical cancer. We've eradicated polio deaths. We should eradicate cervical cancer deaths in the same way. Well, look, we want to get rid of all cancer, there's no doubt about that. What we need is more information, more research. We've worked out how cervical cancer comes about and that has allowed us to develop vaccines and treatments that are effective. We need to be able to do the same for as many cancers as we can. I don't think we'll ever eradicate cancer completely. It's a consequence of the way that our bodies work, that there's a risk of cancer. But we need to look for every factor we can remove that might help to reduce the burden of cancer. Smoking, obviously, excess alcohol consumption, harder to do but effective too. And then there are other things in the, in the environment that we need to do something about as well. A large part of lung cancer these days is caused by atmospheric pollution. And we can do, we can get rid of that. We just have to decide we want to do it. We need to learn from the science that's already been done and we need to carry on doing the science in the future.